Now, when it comes to those who don't start with the Bible, they would say in the beginning matter or in the beginning hydrogen, that matter gave rise to life, and yet observational science does not confirm that. Now, well, maybe it came from outer space. Well, maybe it came, maybe, you know, these things just, you know, somehow got together and over time this happened, but it's just not, things don't do that. We know that from our own experience, you know. You don't just put all the parts of a watch, you know, on the ground and expect a watch to form. You know, it's not going to happen. We know there has to be an intelligence behind that. So it really goes contrary to even what our common experience is and what we know um, has to happen for these kinds of complex things to come about. Darwin himself worked explicitly in the context of the theory of, um, uh, of a concept of uh, design. That is, that the explanation for life as we see it uh, was uh, distinctly and explicitly designed by a creator. The evidence is clear, and the evidence um, doesn't speak for itself, okay? DNA doesn't talk, rocks don't talk, fossils don't talk. I speak for them, or everybody speaks for them. And so what do I think about those things? What do I think, how did they get there? What did they show? Every piece of evidence out there supports what scripture says. It's hard for me to understand, actually, how people can look at that and study that and research that and not acknowledge that there is some, some, something greater, okay, than what they're looking at. It's not just nature alone, so to speak, because the complexity is so immense. And when you look at that, it just sort of speaks screams, you know, this is designed, I mean, this is created, this isn't just by chance. You have to have DNA for all of these things, because DNA gives you the proteins, which, which make up the cellular components, okay, so it's kind of like which came first, the chicken or the egg problem, because you got to have the cell to protect the DNA, but you got to have the DNA to make the parts of the cell. So it becomes kind of a problem in that sense about which came first. But the thing is, is that with the DNA, um, you can't just throw a bunch of DNA bases together, okay, in a test tube and expect them all to come together and form something that's going to give you um, a certain protein. It doesn't happen. It won't happen. It's a random putting together of DNA bases. It doesn't lead to anything but a big mess. And that, that is the central issue is how do you get this genetic information there? How do you, I mean, we're finding even in the DNA, you know, we talk about the, the gene, you know, the part that codes for protein, but the stuff in between, the 98% of our DNA, that they call junk, it isn't junk. It does something. It's really, really important in regulating those genes. So this is very complex. How do you put this together by random chance over time? No one would think that. You know, when we look at forensics and all those things today. Now, if mutations cannot be produced according to need, you can't have a creature that would love to fly. Let's say some reptile saying, I'd really like to fly. I think I'm going to put a lot of thought to it and evolve some wings. It doesn't work that way. Random, purposeless, goalless mutations would have to come up purely by chance, with no object or, or, or goal in mind, uh, come up with all of the genes, all the integrated gene products to produce wings, and then you could select for it. They believe that one kind of animal changed into another, but the study of genetics shows you can have great variation within a kind, you can see natural selection, you can see speciation, but it's always within a kind, and the biblical kind is more like a family uh, level of classification, foreign class order family, genus species. The problem is those mechanisms don't work. I mean, we know from science today, what we call observational science that we can do in the lab, we know that yes, mutation does occur, a natural selection does occur, but it doesn't add anything. It doesn't make new structures. It doesn't make new things. You can't go from an apple to a lemon, so to speak. You're not going to get there by the mechanisms that we know of today, um, by mutation, by natural selection. Now, they might say, well, there's some mechanism we just don't know about. OK? <laughs> you know, and so that's a problem. And, it, and that's why it really helps us know. That's why we have to go back to our starting points. What are our starting points? Is it that God did this, or is it that nature did this by itself? We define evolution as molecules to man, okay, going from some sort of single cell and organism to people today. Whereas what they talk about a lot of times, what they're seeing is when they say evolution, they're, they're seeing things on a very um, small scale, so to speak, changes within a kind of animal, like the Bible talks about. Like, it, we see this today, we see this happening, but they're saying, oh, just give it enough time. 
if you just give it enough time, you're going to see, you know, whatever, a dinosaur evolve into a bird. But the problem is the mechanism does not work. Mutations and natural selection simply don't do that. The is how do you get genetic information? How do you get information that will make a placenta or a liver or a kidney? Uh, or an eye. This isn't just a single dumb luck stroke. This is a whole integrated system of complexity. Sort of like when the symphony orchestra plays. Uh, when they're tuning up, you think, no way, we're not going to get any music out of this group. It's chaos, but the conductor goes tick, tick, and the, and the music happens, and it's beautiful. And you went from complexity to integrated complexity. Many of the scientists of Darwin's time did not accept that, even though they liked the idea that there was a materialistic explanation of origins. For example, Thomas Huxley, being an atheist, loved the idea that Darwin seemed to have a way to explain how everything come to be without any kind of divine intervention, all by a natural process. He loved that aspect, and thus was a champion of Darwin. But Thomas Huxley himself was never really convinced that Darwin's explanation of random change in natural selection could achieve the results that we see in biological systems. Do you believe that there is an organism in the fossil record that clearly represents a stage in the evolution of A to C by way of B? In other words, a transition. No, we have no way of knowing whether that's true. In fact, as evolutionists themselves have declared, there's no way to be certain that any particular fossil we see in the fossil record is a direct ancestor of any other. What would be a better name that I might be willing to accept than transitional form? You could say, do you believe that when you look at biological systems or fossils or living animals, do you believe that you see traits, physical traits that are sort of between A and C? Yes. Yes, I see people that have long arms and medium-sized arms and short arms. I see people with different shades of hair. And, uh, uh, when I look at living creatures, I can see that the eyes of a horseshoe crab are very different than the eyes of cats or dogs or people. Uh, the question is, are those differences best explained by being an evolutionary transition, which is arguing that we know that the organism was trans transitioning from A to C? We don't know that. If you tell me there's some uh, structure that's sort of intermediate in appearance for a particular thing, I can accept that. It doesn't seem unreasonable to me. <laughs> it's what does it mean? That's it. That's the issue. I believe that there is indeed a creator God, and my career working in science, which involved uh, about 40 years of bench science at some of America's premier biomedical research institutions. It was in no way hampered by my biblical views because I stuck to empirical science, the observable, the repeatable, the testable. Never had a single complaint from a student in all those years because I stuck to what I could see. I didn't say, where did we get kidneys from? I said, this is the way the kidney looks. This is the way it's put together. It's a little different in a camel or a mouse, but it's fundamentally the same. The functional unit is the nephron. It engages in three processes, filtration, absorption, and secretion. Here's where these processes occur. If somebody didn't believe me, they could go and look for themselves. But I never bothered at the end of the lecture to blow smoke in my students' ears. <laughs> and speculate on how we come to have kidneys from no kidneys at all.